Welcome to Red Sailor View. Hello. We are doing part three of Kiss from Worst to Best. That's right. Greg, what are we doing today? Today Greg? we are doing numbers 14, 13, and 12, which are Carnival of Souls, Animal Eyes, and this is going to piss someone off, but Destroyer. <laughs> no, I'm already pissed. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, that is like one of the top kiss albums so yeah i could see why some people would get pissed but we'll you know talk about that, uh, i get i get it i totally get it it was one of the ones i i had the hardest time placing i mean they went from being a spectacle to being superheroes right. on that record but it has its flaws and we will get to that i i think it's the album cover that really people love the most about that album I don't well, agree with that. It's a really I, iconic, I, awesome I, album I, cover. I agree it's iconic, but look at the song list on that. Like the stupid we'll we'll get off. to it. Yeah, that's stupid. Yeah, we'll get to it. All right. All right. So we're starting with Carnival of Souls. Yes. All right, go ahead. Very good, but miss. well, I don't know if I can really say misunderstood because Paul definitely wasn't into it at all. And Bruce even says that in interviews. Really, I'm shocked because Paul really seems like he's uh he shines on that album. He, he does. Yeah. He he really, yeah. really does. I yeah, but I don't think he's ever had anything good to say about it. No, you know why he doesn't have anything good to say about it? Because if it sold 10 million albums, he would have been praising it to the stars. But because it didn't do that well, it's shit. Continue, right? Point. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's he totally does sound forced at points on here, though. There, there's a few songs where you can tell he probably wasn't the most into it. Um, it's still better him being restrained than the fucking falsetto of the late 80s, though, I have right. to say. So yeah. That I don't mind so much. And I mean, uh, well, Jungle, you know, that's one of his tunes, and it's mm. the best song on here, I would say. Um the biggest part of that, though, is, you know, Bruce and Bruce Kulik and Eric Singer had a lot of fun writing this record, and most of it came out of their jams. I mean, Bruce has nine co-writing credits on this, you know. He was really one of the main architects of this record, and him and Eric Singer just have this funky groove going that uh, kicks ass. Yes, they... Uh, they go grunge, I suppose you yeah. could say, but but realistically if you look at revenge i think they were only going to get darker as they were moving along with their music and bruce says the same thing but well you have alice in chains and soundgarden that really made an impression both on bruce and gene gene actually really got into this i think he's got six co-writing credits on this and uh Actually got into it with Eric and Bruce, though his songs aren't always the best. Actually, one of his tunes is the one I hate the most on here. And I have to look it up because I can't remember off the top of my head, but I have it in my notes. I'm interested to think what your least favorite song is on this. But, we may uh, disagree on it. Probably Seduction well. of the Innocent. It's just, it's clunky. The music to it isn't super bad, but it, it sounds like the lyrics were for something totally separate and Gene throw them on. And it just, it doesn't work overall for me. But uh, next to Jungle, honestly, the best track on it is I Walk Alone. Just a total testament to how good of a player and songwriter Bruce Kulik is. And he sings. I'll agree with that. It too. I'm trying to remember the name of the ballad on here. Is it I, I will, will be, be there? there? Yeah, great song, man. I agree. That's uh that's what something like Reason to Live should have been. <laughs> well, I definitely think it's their best ballad since I still love you. Like their best written mm -hmm. and sounding ballad. Oh, big time. It's a great tune. Honestly, I mean well, we with any kind of later era Kiss album, you, you get songs that drag and kind of end up sounding samey, but I mean, at least half of the and Seduction of the Innocent, there's nothing really on here that makes me want to click it off. You know I, what I mean? I, I just had to look up what that song was, because I can't remember its song titles, and I just looked it up, and um, that is one of my favorite songs off of this album. 
Really? <laughs> it, it, it really is. I think it's it's I very, very like it catchy. Quite a bit. It's yeah, very catchy, especially when it gets to that chorus. I mean, it's just it really is such a, a really good song. And the way Gene sings it too, it's it's um I don't know, about just yeah, seduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a really you guys good. don't find the vocal line clunky at all. No, not at all. Uh uh-uh. I I think it's one of the okay songs on the album, to be honest. Huh. Interesting. Musically, it's it's all right. I mean, that, that's one of the ones that does delve a little too deep in Alice in Chains territory. But I think a lot of that, too, has to do with the production and the fact that no, Toby was... Wright engineered a lot of yeah. Alice in Chains stuff. Yeah, Toby Wright did a lot of that, those albums, at least the first two, I think, you know. Of Alice in Chains. He definitely did the first two. I want to say he did the self title as well, but I'm not sure. I yeah, I don't think in one of the EPs. Yeah, I don't have that stuff in front of me, like so I can't look it up. But um, I remember, well, I remember I get... when this uh, when this thing came out, and they didn't even like do any kind of like press or anything for it, right? No, no, not really. The only reason they ended up releasing this is because of how heavily bootleg it ended up. Mm. Um, once, G- well, the the whole recording process behind it was a little weird, it, at least for Bruce and Eric, because they were in the middle of planning the reunion tour, but they were going to keep Bruce and Eric on for, I believe it was a year and a half, just in case something went wrong and they had to cancel it and regroup. And even though the majority of this record was done before the unplugged performance, there was no plan to release it originally. They were just going to shelve it, move into the reunion. Mm. But um, it ended up so heavily bootlegged and the bootleg sounded so bad, they decided to finish it and release it. Yeah. Because I remember going, I, I was in the mall and, and I actually remember seeing it sitting there. I'm like, what the hell is this? Is a new Kiss album? And, and it's got a weird cover. It looks like it's just thrown together you know just to put something out there and uh yeah i was shocked that it was that but then i heard well, I I hearing the jungle on the radio too at some point yeah i heard jungle on 89.5 wsou fm and uh thought it was a really good song but of all the places i found this album where would you think i had actually found it when when it was released under the radar I don't the astoria know. I mean... the astoria public library <laughs> <laughs> wow okay i found it at kmart but i found it at walmart before. is where i bought it i remember that wow. yeah i remember those days when they actually sold stuff um <sighs> but yeah i picked it up and uh, i i did not expect it to be so grungy it sounds just like it sounds like Al- uh, kiss doing alice in chains basically and um i'm a huge alice in chains fan so i'm okay with it and, and i really like the album i think it's it's one of my favorite ones honestly because it, it, it's very dark it's not it's not very kiss at all. There's not, you know, you can obviously Paul Stanley, you can hear his singing and he does fit very well with the style of music. I think, I, I don't know why he wouldn't like it. I could just like Manny said, I guess, cause it didn't sell well, but um, I, I really like, almost, I like, uh, cause I was talking to you guys earlier cause I was seeing which songs I like off of each album. And I like nine songs off of this album. There's 12 on there. Right. I think. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, I pretty much like this whole thing. And uh, I like how just Kiss just, you know, put out this kind of album. It just doesn't sound like their normal stuff. And it there's just like one good song after the other on here. You know, especially that Seduction of Innocent. I just, I, I like how Gene sings it. I like the the lyrics. I like the topic, you know, it's just cool. Jungle's really cool. Uh, I think Hate End is really good. Yeah, I think Hate is Gene's best performance on here. Yeah, I think so too. And then um, Bruce Kulick sings a song, right? The last one, I Walk Along. Yep. Yeah, I, I Walk, walk Along. He yep. sings really good, you know? I and mean, I never heard him sing before before that. So. Dude, there, there's so much passion in that song too. And the groove him and Eric are in is just badass. Yeah. Yeah, I, I well, really wish they would have continued with another album maybe to, because of the production was kind of low on this one. Maybe the next one would have been a lot better. To, to be honest, I'm, I'm happy they pursued the darker route, and I like this album a lot, but I would have preferred their next one was still kind of heavier in this style, but was more like revenge, and that right. was a little bit more Kiss-like. Yeah, yeah. I have to Although, agree with you. I, I we'll would let you say, in at some point, Manny. Sorry, sorry Manny. I just <laughs> want to say this before I forget. Although I would say, even though this is one of the ones that is definitely the least kiss-like, yeah. 
I think there's more of that organicness in the songwriting and even how they're playing it that is kiss like yeah. unlike shit like asylum for right. example yeah yeah no, i totally agree because this is pure they're just writing music you know having yep. fun and, and just working on songs where as the other albums are kind of forced to do what they're doing this one nobody gave a shit about kiss at this point and they're doing what they want to do i think that greg is right i think that if this lineup had continued because the original thing was they're going to do the reunion tour and then we'll get the original this lineup back together and looking back that's probably unrealistic because then you go from playing huge stadiums to playing mid-size arenas or whatever you know <laughs> and that probably wouldn't have flown but i think if they had continued i think it would have stayed on this path i mean they saw the writing of all i mean even though paul fit in very well with the glam slash hair metal air gene simmons certainly did not was not very comfortable <laughs> during that era mm. it turns out he can write songs that fit into that style but his persona didn't fit in and revenge and the thing about revenge is it got kids when i say kids at the time kids that weren't into kiss for buying kiss albums you know and revenge did that now, that doesn't translate to going to see him in big shows, but it did sell very well, and it got, for the first time, critical acclaim. But then all our guys are getting critical acclaim by the early 90s, finally, you know. Yeah. But So I don't know how much that counts, but I, I do agree with Greg. As far as Paul Stanley's reaction, I look at it the way of The Elder, too. If The Elder had sold, you know, 5 million copies or whatever, 2 million, Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons would be telling you how wonderful it is and how smart they are. Yeah. But because it failed, you know, now their narrative is, well, it was a mistake, blah, 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 you know. And from their point of view, maybe it was, you know, looking back on it. Um, but I, I think that this album is a great Kiss album. Yeah, it sounds like Kiss Garden, but it still has enough of their identity that it, mm -hmm. you know, it, it sounds like Kiss. And I think it's a great album, and I think they met to the challenge, and I think they were smart to hire Toby Wright as a producer because he could get them disciplined to get that sound. Oh. <clears throat> and, of course, it figures the one time give Bruce Kulick, uh, Kulick uh, free creative reign, of course, and this is when the original lineup gets back together. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poor Bruce. You know, he he gets screwed a couple of times throughout the years. Is Nevison didn't like a lot of his ideas on Crazy Nights, like Sword and Stone, and then you get to this record, and it ends up getting buried for the reunion. Poor guy can't win. <laughs> yeah, but Paul Stanley wasn't help happy with uh, Ron Nevison. You know, I don't know if Gene Simmons. He was. Did. Yeah, but not anymore. I mean, have you recent years? He just didn't like. Oh no, no! In recent years, I'm talking back then. He wanted to work with him, and he how great Ron was, and the production was. Now, only in hindsight, does he see that he's wrong? Yeah, but you hire Ron Nevison to get that sound. I mean, that's why Hart hired him. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who else worked with him, but Ozzy. I mean, the guys get. Oh, that's right. Ozzy did. Ultimate yep. Sin. Ultimate Sin, yeah. Yeah, you're right. And there you go. That's a perfect example of that that sound. The difference is that Ozzy didn't hire any high outside songwriters. It was him, Jakey Lee, and Bob Daisley, I believe, right? Yeah, although Susan, Phil Susan gets a credit on uh, Shot in the Dark. On, I know, yep. because he's been writing the coattails of that for like 50 years now. But um, <laughs> Well, if you've ever heard the original... Oh, never mind. We talked about this when we did Ozzy. Yeah. 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 But anyway, um, they were very smart. And um, on this album, they didn't uh, kiss didn't have any outside writers where on Crazy Nights they did. That doesn't make uh, it a bad that's album. That's actually not true. No, Simmons is writing partner Van Zenz on a couple. Oh, of yeah. Movies. And uh, Tommy Thayer. Tommy, right Tommy Thayer, Kurt, yeah. Kurt Cuomo, and Jamie St. James. Yeah, but Two those four. aren't the song writing doctors that we were used to. There's no Desmond Child or Diane Warren. Or no, but they're not, they're not Kiss members. No, they're, no, they're, but there wasn't at the time. No, but I I consider these guys, these are real collaborative. This is not, let's call uh, 
what is that one lady's name? Holly Knight. You know, let's call her up because we need to, see, you know, for crazy nights or whatever. You know, they were trying to go for radio. This, I think they were going for radio, but they were trying to do it in their own way. And I think the songwriters that they co-wrote with, that was more organic, if that makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. this time around, they were trying to go against the the Nirvanas, Green Days, uh, Alice and Jameses, and Soundgardens of the time. Yeah, yeah. I All agree. right, Lou. What do you feel? Yeah, Lou. Wayne, did you did you say what you had to say? Yeah. Yep. Um. <laughs> all right. So, hold on. Let me get my notes out. Uh, Carlos Carlos. Carlos. So this is actually number twelve on my list of twenty Kiss albums. Um, Kiss doing it. Alice. Kiss doing Alice in Chains, or Kiss expanding themselves as songwriters. Every time they experiment, it gets tarnished by casual fans and mainstream press. Why? I like it when a band experiments. It keeps the ideas fresh. It's not like they release 35 minutes of noise like Lou Reed. There's some good stuff on here. In fact, I love this album and regret having it to having to put it so low on my list, but that's only because I love the other albums that much more. The band sounds tight here. Gene's putting forth a lot of effort. Bruce is finally taking center stage with I Walk Alone. Although I will admit the one part of the song that I despise is the reverse drums during the guitar solo. I just find that so annoying. <laughs> uh, and Paul writes a ballad for his son that, in my opinion, is the best ballad they've written since I Still Love You. Not taking aw away anything from every time I look at you, but I think this is a far superior song, in my, in my opinion. Um, the production is a little off. Maybe it's just the fact that the mastering is what it is. I mean, apparently, it does say that it was mastered on the album uh, on the album sleeve, but you know, I've heard bad mastering. <laughs> uh, but I could look past it. I would have loved to have heard more material from this lineup. Uh, to me, standout tracks are "Hate," "Childhood Zen," "I Will Be There," "Jungle," which I agree with you, Greg, is the best song on the album. Um, in my head, I confess, and I walk alone okay tracks i would say rain in the mirror seduction of the innocent and it never goes away my least favorite track on the album and y'all might hate me for saying this but it's just my opinion so take it for what it is master and slave not a fan mm. oh, i love that song mm. yeah i really like that one i do too I, I couldn't get into it guys i tried <laughs> i'm sorry try again. nope not right only because you asked you. I confess is one of the best ones. Though. It is. Great. It really is. I forgot to well, mention that, but that is a really, really good one. I movie. love Childhood Zen. I like the, um, it's not mm. an original story, you know, where Gene read about a friend that, you know, so I love that song. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and his vocal on it's fantastic. Anyway, go ahead. It's really nice to hear Gene not sing about like, you know, as we'll get into. 16. 16. Yeah, I mean, it shows that he's got, you know, real talent when he when he puts his best efforts forward. Well, the thing about those no, two yeah, guys, because, you know, we're going to get to his commercial for Dora Flame Logs yeah. pretty shortly here. But the thing about Paul and Gene is they're very, very bright guys. They're not your typical. They're smart you know, businessmen. Yeah, but they're just smart guys in general. I mean, they have a lot of interest outside of of Kiss and music, but. Especially Gene in the 80s played up to that, you know, I've slept with a thousand women and all this other bullshit that in this day and age doesn't look too good. But, you know, that was another era. Well, he had to do something. I mean, he was probably the one when the makeup came off that was hurt the most by losing the character. He was. Yeah, he was. He was, and he was the he first was. to admit that. Yeah. But, um... Oh, now, unlike like Asylum, Crazy Nights, and even as much as I love them, Dynasty and Unmasked, you know, Carnival of Souls has the benefit of it not being a change for the money or the business. It's them honestly trying to find their place in the new music scene. And I think that's another mm -hmm. thing that helps it a lot. Yeah. There isn't, they weren't running around saying, hey, go grab me Chris Cornell or Kim Thale to help write this song. You know, there's none of that gimmicky shit. Well, I definitely think that their reunion around this time helped 
bring in the onslaught of 70s and 80s bands that experienced a surge in popularity, mm -hmm. you know, with the Scorpions, with Molly Crew, with Def Leppard. You know, I, I you have to give all the credit, even Iron Maiden, because, you know, three years after the Kiss reunion, Bruce got back together with the band and they've been they haven't stopped since then. So, well, it, it's kind of a. Uh during that time you're right and um halford had released his first album under his own name sabbath reunited for a tour um so yeah it was kind of funny because it we re remember the grunge era is lasting so long but if you think about it, it's maybe two years I'm not talking about albums that were released after that, but never mind. Um, Bad Motor Finger, 10. And what was the uh, other big one? Well, Facelift or Dirt. That's 90 to 92. 91. Yeah. 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 You know, after that, 94, Kurt Cobain dies. Um, and, but also it brought back a lot of. I remember uh, there suddenly VH1 was doing documentaries on heavy metal, heavy, the story, the top 100 hard rock metal bands of all time. That would have been unthinkable just a year earlier than that. I mean, it's, this well, is all, this is thinking back on it at the time. I didn't think twice about it, but. No. Well, that was like early, late nineties, early two thousands, the hundred greatest artists of hard rock and yeah, whatever the, the show that you're talking about, heavy, the story of metal, that was, um, that was after the success of, um, uh, metal, a headbanger's journey, which came out in 2005 MTV was doing these retrospectives on, uh, on, uh, during the mid nineties of, you know, what they call the hair bands. And whatever, yeah. and you know, you got to see what Dokken was doing or what Quiet Riot was doing. And I was just like, you know, uh, these guys were your bread and butter for the longest time, and then you pissed on them once you know something new came on. Mm -hmm. Now, you yeah. know, you know I, I'd, I'd be silly to think that musical tastes are forever, you know, the true fans stick around forever, but you know, every generation is different. You know, and, uh, you know, when my brothers were growing up, you know, they had, uh, you know, the 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 classic Metallica albums and the classic Maiden albums. Um, and even though metal wasn't as popular in the 90s as it was in the 80s, I'm grateful that I had bands like Typo Negative and uh, Fear Factory to uh, keep my um, love for the genre still going. I'm going to be completely honest with you there, too, though. In a way, I'm kind of glad it wasn't on top of the world super popular then because it enabled me to discover a lot of it on my own mm -hmm. without any bias. Yeah, And also, you could get them for like a buck a CD or 50 cents a cassette because <laughs> nobody wanted this shit at the time. Yeah, You couldn't give away a Venom album. I mean, do you think, honestly, a band like Kingdom Come would have had any success if it wasn't for MTV playing them? There would have been no organic no. traffic to them. Because it would have never stood out on radio, you know. There... Yes, technically there's hooks to it, but there's nothing super memorable about it. Well, no. what's memorable is the Led Zeppelin comparison. I actually like that Kingdom Come album, but I like it for the very reason everybody hates it, because it sounds like lightweight led zeppelin not I'll totally because led zeppelin you. had a lot of depth to it kingdom come is one note and that's not a put down to kingdom come it's just a fact i like it but it you know led zeppelin had acoustic songs you know hard rocks anyway you know you know i'm just being Probably objective about everybody it. That's all. over blew the comparison to be honest i mean yes zeppelin was an influence but they were for a lot of bands like that and they just kind of did a similar bluesy type style they i don't i would never stop and say they ripped them off to the t like a lot of people used to now greta van fleet's a different story <laughs> well i like greta van fleet better you than watch him now Tom, but... but what i'm saying is that is blatant if you sit down and listen to it kingdom come is just kind of, kind of in the same wheelhouse well what i really like about this kiss album is like what you guys said it's different 
But that's what I liked about the 90s scene because those guys were influenced by everybody. Smash and Pumpkins loved Kiss as much as they loved Jesus and the Mary Chain and Black Flag and Led Zeppelin. Pearl Jam. These guys had a wide range of influences where the 80s band seemed to start at Arrow and then at Smith, you know. I'm exaggerating, but there were so many bands that were into Aerosmith and mm. they had to have a guitar player that was like a Eddie Van Halen and let's face it most of those guys in those so-called hair bands were pretty freaking phenomenal musicians you know guitarists but yeah well yeah. let's also remind ourselves though that this album was being recorded be after the revenge tour between 93 and 94 so yeah. if they had struck while the, the iron the was the majority hot, of it was recorded in 95 oh, okay well, you know, if they had struck while the iron is hot, maybe it would have fared against some of the more popular bands. I will say this, though. If if mm -hmm. Kiss had, you know, tried to tap in to what was going on with the pop punk and emo punk stuff no. that was going on, that would have been horrible. <laughs> no, that would have been I'm, I'm just being honest. And I, no, I, that, that, that. And I love the I band just, Jimmy I just World. I think they get a bad rap. <laughs> Yeah, I just envisioned Gene singing all the small things, and <laughs> with, with the as refrain funny going, as that would be. Thank God it never happened. <laughs> with the repeat chorus being "Not me, I'm not small." <laughs> anyway. I don't know. I, I can't imagine. Uh, I think even they have their limits. How much of a trend they'll chase? I hope you know. Uh, I think they do to an extent, and that, that's one thing that really irritates me about some things they'll say retrospectively at points, like, Gene, oh, I'd be embarrassed to play Unmasked for my mother. Yeah, whatever. You, you say that about different albums all the time because of the trend you change. Just own it. Move on. That's it. That's it. All right, what's the next album? Paul Stanley's second solo album, Animal Eyes. <laughs> well, I I mean, you know, really, and even though yes, I I like one of the gene songs on here and am at least entertained by the rest, he literally crapped out four demos, then went to shoot a movie. You know, mm -hmm. it it kind of leave Paul leaves Paul hanging a lot, and even though they use those songs. You can tell Paul definitely put the feel on it and made it fit in with the rest of the album during the production phase and all that because, yeah, I'm pretty sure he produced this one. He did. He did. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, actually, one thing that's kind of funny, uh, Jean Bovar from the Plasmatics plays on three tunes on this, and I know he, I know he wrote Thrills in the Night with mm -hmm. Paul, but I have to bring up my notes here phenomenal here. bass player by the way oh he totally is and and what what i was gonna say was uh nothing against him i just thought it was funny because paul was doing some retrospective interviews and you know brought up how out of touch gene was at this point in time and even had uh uh was it quotes from ron nevison in there talking about crazy nights and how yeah, Gene was there, but he spent most of the time in the back of the studio reading uh, Variety. So Paul says what he has to say about this album, and all of a sudden Gene secures some interview with Jean for him to say, well, Gene was there the whole time I was a Bullshit. If Gene was there, why were you recording this extra bass on these other songs? <laughs> <laughs> but It makes, it makes sense because Jean's uh, talent is completely different different from jeans you know gene does great walking bass lines jean full-on rhythmic beast sorry greg continue it's okay i was gonna say that actually came about on under the gun and fuck, what was the other song get all you can take because originally mark st john who by the way part of the reason this album ranks so low for me although i do like well, Kiss, when they get lost in being metal Kiss, it doesn't always end up the best. But cranking up the tempo and adding some speed and a little bit of heaviness here, even though they were riffing on, you know, like Doc and a Motley Crew and the like, I really think it works well for them here for the most part. 
But Mark St. John, though immensely talented, does not fit in with Kiss. And that's all there is to that. But uh, anyway, they wanted him to play the bass on those tunes. And he fought him every step of the way. Absolutely not. I'm not playing it like that. And then they would try to talk to him about the way he was playing certain songs. Even Eric Carr tried to talk to him about it. Um, you know, Paul calls it puking notes. I guess you can say that about almost any shredder, really. But when you sit and really listen to this album, he does pull that bullshit quite often where he just goes off on a tangent and it doesn't really fit the rest of the song. The most noticeable one is uh, probably in Thrills on the Night on the Bridges. I mean, he comes in with that, and that, that shit's cool, but he just goes off on a tangent, like a Vinnie Vincent live solo during the Lick It Up tour. <laughs> and okay. it, it's unfortunate because he was talented, and I mean, I guess it kind of sounds wrong to say, oh, he should have conformed, but not that he had to change his style, but he really needed to listen and hear what would be good with the song and what didn't work. Because yeah, but Paul Stanley's a producer. So it would oh, have been I his know job. That. Yeah. But I mean, you hire on this guitar player, you're not going to go through and completely re-record everything. No, but you hired the guitar player to do specifically to sound like that, you know? I mean, they could have hired um, somebody else, but they chose him because of the way he played, the speed, he fit in with that shredding, you know, that shredding era at the time. Mark St. John is probably the most talented, unknown, famous person ever. I mean, here he was in his famous. It's like um, it's not quite like the Tommy Bolin era of Deep Purple because Tommy Bolin has a huge following in death where Mark St. John is known by us. We're fans of Kiss. There's no... Well, you his know, White Tiger album was good, but yeah. It was okay, but yeah, it, but not yeah. a lot of people, you know. We yeah. we have to take one thing into account. When Mark joined KISS, he was 24. Mm. 10 years younger than Gene, Eric, and Paul. Having been... I think Mark got the offer. Mark saw a big name, and as a matter of fact, he admitted admitted this too before he passed in an interview mark got in the band mark got to the sessions and started writing it with him and all of a sudden mark discovered he really didn't want to be in kiss and yeah. i think being so young that was a very hard thing for him to deal with and i don't think he knew how to express it which is the unfortunate part and and having been a 24 year old guitar player i've found myself in that position where sometimes you're dealing with people that you really don't want to deal with, but you're kind of that guy that's afraid to rock the boat. Um, so although, you know, you'll, you'll stay silent when it comes to that, when it, then you do what he does on the album and quote unquote puke notes, because that's how you play, you know, at that, at that point, 24 years old, you're still playing to say, oh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good, as opposed to playing what's right for the song. Um, you know, this was the one of the few occasions where hiring a fusion guitar player to be in a hard rock band does not work, as opposed why to the one time where it did work, which was Chris Poland and Megadeth. Mm. Why did they pick Mark St. John? Like, was there nobody else? Like, where did he even come from? That's he a good was a question. Complete unknown. He was a, he he auditioned. Complete unknown. Yeah, and he was he was recommended, I believe, by Mike Varney, who uh, used to run a column in Guitar for the Practicing Musician. He's also he's the owner like, of Shrapnel. Yeah, and he discovered, I believe, uh, Ingve and discovered um, Paul Gilbert, Tony Acapine, and Jason Becker. Um, but I believe that recommendation came from him, even though. As far as I know, he never, you know, he never signed them to Shrapnel. He never put out a, I don't know if you guys remember, but Shrapnel in the 80s at that time, we put out nothing but shredding albums, all instrumental. Yep. Um, yeah. I think Steeler was the only exception to that in Keel. But 
Don't forget Racer yeah. X. Yeah, yeah, but Racer X fits the mode for one reason because it's all you know crazy guitar playing, excellent stuff. But yeah, they had singing in it. But yeah, I guess yeah. Racer X. But um, well, that was a close knit tight unit. Grover Jackson introduced him to Paul Stanley. So that, it was Grover Jackson. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense because Jackson guitars, Kiss were using them at that point. So it was uh, Mark St. John. In fact, he used the single coil um, uh, three pickup uh, Jackson, which is not easy to uh, to come by unless you get it custom made. <laughs> but uh, the, I know nerd. Shut up. <laughs> but the thing is, um, you know, those that California scene at the time with Shrapnel and with Guitar World and with Musicians Institute and uh, you know, um, SIR, no, not SIR, but, but the Musicians Institute, like uh, all that, it, it's all interconnected. So it makes sense that they they got him from there. Very interesting. And, very interesting. And I did go back into my notes and read Manny. Yes, Paul Stanley did go through and Doctor Mark solos throughout. Yeah, and I think Bruce yeah. ended up doing two of the songs, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Bruce did. So, one thing we've talked about everything, but what are your thoughts on the album, Greg? Yeah, sorry, Greg. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've talked about everything, the history of the album and production, but you know, it's not their best, but I do like it a lot. I mean, when they're on, they're really on. I've had enough into the fires, a great song, Under the Gun, Thrills in the Night, uh. Heaven's on Fire, as goofy as it might be, is a great, catchy tune. Um, I really, for whatever reason, love Lonely as the Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Which it doesn't sound like Gene put in a lot of effort into. But you no don't say. In that. Yeah, it, but I like it too. But you can but, tell it's just, like it you said, he just shit it, it out. <laughs> yep. Mark has a great solo in that too. Actually, I think it's Mark. I don't think yeah, I'm pretty one sure of the that's ones Bruce did. Yeah, I think that was one of the ones Bruce did. That and Murder yeah, okay, in High Heels. That is Bruce. Yeah, Murder in High Heels. It's not St. John. Nope. Oh, okay. Oh, I was thinking of While the City Sleeps because it ends with While the City Sleeps and Murder in High Heels. I actually like that whole album, but we'll get to it in a minute. I want to hear yeah. the rest of your thoughts. Well, Clay really? goes first. <laughs> Really, the only songs I can say I don't like at all: "Burn, Bitch, Burn," and "Get All oh, You Can Take." It's so They're terrible! Just... Oh come on, it's so you're bad. Not... I want to put my log in your fireplace. Come on, what? That's poetry. <laughs> yeah, that's what I tell when I'm at a bar. That's what I tell girls. And they that's how you pick up all your chicks, huh? All of them, man. Just Damn. I just quote <laughs> Kiss songs, and they're like. Oh. <laughs> A letter like that will get you a chick and make nugget anyway. <laughs> but yeah, other than two songs, I really like every song on here for the most really? part. Really? Really? Yeah. Wow. Although some of it does drag a little bit, but mm. you know, with the majority of these albums, especially in the 80s, there, there was always filler tunes. It's just mm. Sometimes the filler is good and it's palatable, and sometimes it's crap. For well, the man, most the part on only here, like thirty-four minutes long. Yeah, it's not right? a long album. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, it, it, really, it's it's uh, murder in high heels and burn, bitch, burn. That drag for me. They're just oh, and get get all you can take. Jesus, that is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's Kiss, but good luck. I, I do like that song, but I, I know why you cringe because it's ridiculous. It's it's absurd. I mean, it isn't poison level bad, but poison have never written get a song down, that bad. All That's around. Bad. You gotta get on your you really the fucking course is what fucking difference does it make? Like that <laughs> this is where we're at in 1984. In so Kiss. edgy. It was edgy in 84, man. I mean, to me, it sounded like a bad take on a Led Zeppelin type riff. I mean, you know. Oh, don't insult Led Zeppelin. Like no, that. I'm not insulting Led Zeppelin. I'm saying it was a bad attempt at trying to do a Zeppelin like riff. A better example of them actually succeeding at it would have been Keep It Keep Me Coming off Creatures. This was the opposite. Yep. Exactly. 
I only like four songs off of this album. I've had enough into the fire, heavens on fire, thrills the night, and while the city sleeps. Uh, the rest of this album just kind of, and, and it's pretty much as you described it. It's just kind of like thrown together, you know. The Gene songs just kind of just go nowhere, you know, and just it is what it is. Yeah, I just I, at least listened to Kiss. Album I know, album, I know why you don't like Under the Gun. Why Double Bass Kiss? Double Bass Kiss. Yes, I'm not a huge fan of Double Bass Kiss songs. Interesting. I I kind of I know you're not, but I thought you might have liked this one because it, Eric does great on it. I he does, it's, but it's it, his best double bass work. To be yeah, honest, it it actually yeah, yeah it is, and it's heavy too. This is a really heavy album at at this time for them. You know, yeah, I oh, think yeah. this is really the first. It's even heavier than Creatures because Creatures is pretty heavy, but this is like even heavier. This brings in I... more. In, you don't think so? This no, this sounds, sounds more metal than Creatures. creatures. Mm, I don't think so. Is, Obviously, you've been drinking, Wayne. No, because there's there's no double bass stuff in in creatures. There's it, there isn't here. I mean, there's a this few. Is things, more, this is more in the speed metal, right? Type of wheelhouse, if you will. But Shrapnel. in terms of intensity and dynamics, it is not heavier than creatures. Well, Michael James Jackson is a better producer than Paul fucking Stanley, too. Yes, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> that, sound wise, it's that's a true. Yeah, but uh, I understand what you mean. Right. Yes. Uh, I would have given you double points if you had said uh, Stanley Bert Eisen, not Paul fucking Stanley. But uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> but yeah, this this is my least one of my least favorite, uh, at least listened to Kiss album. So I'm surprised you have this up so high on your list because this would be down towards the bottom for me. To be honest, um, a big reason, even though I complained about how he doesn't fit in all the time, but Mark St. John's guitar playing, he was well, like. Like Vinnie Vincent, he was almost overqualified to be right. in Kiss. Really, yeah. it um, un unfortunately his style is just so far and away; it doesn't always quite work with them. But uh, for considering Crazy Nights as the pop metal album, and then Asylum as the glam metal album, th this is Kiss doing eighties metal right. And mm. yeah, well. Mm -hmm. be for Luke like gives it. thoughts, I'll give my thoughts. I, when I first bought the album, I was thirteen or fourteen, and I really loved the album. Matter of fact, the first time I saw Kiss was on this tour. Um, mm -hmm. I was at, and I love the album. As I've grown older, take away the nostalgia factor, I still think it's a good album, but it's a good album of its time period. I certainly couldn't give this album to say my one of my kids. They don't like Kiss anyway, but, you know, to introduce them to Kiss, this would not work for them. You know, it it is so of its time period. Even the back cover, you know, with their outfits and the type of photography, it definitely is of its time. Um, I, I used to listen to that, that album a lot, and I, I think you're right. It's it Mark St. John... Um, well, honestly, I didn't rate him very highly as a kid. Um, and think when this album came out, what, not 83 or 84, right? 84. 84. 84. So it was big. Motley Crue, Dokken, Twisted Sister. There was no formula then. There was no pop metal formula then. You know, the po you know, uh, Motley Crue hadn't written Home Sweet Home yet. Um, Poison didn't exist yet, at least not to the general public. Wasp was getting. She didn't attention. exist at all. Well, my point is that it wasn't as formulaic as it would be. Where you know, Twisted Sister would help turn it that way. You've got to have the uh, the anthem, and then you've got to have your rock song, and then you've got to have your ballad. And in '84, it was beginning to creep up. It didn't yet exist, you know. And this, and then the, on this case of this album is also the outside songwriters are used to to help make the songs a little more radio friendly, but doesn't go over the top like they would with uh, Crazy Nights or even Asylum. You know, in my opinion, I, so. I don't think this album's radio friendly at all, except for Heavens on Fire. I think that's the only single that was. It is. No, it no, was no. Thrills uh, in the night. I'm wrong. In night. Thrills in the night was a single, right? Oh, guys? really? I didn't even know. Yeah, yeah. They released a video for it too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember because it only showed it a couple times. 
But the album is a huge seller and it did its job. I just don't think it holds up that well anymore. Mm -hmm. Nostalgically for me, I like it a lot. Um, but if I were to take that out of it equation, I hate to agree with Wayne. It'd probably be at the near the bottom. You know, take out my personal bias toward it, probably be near the bottom, you know. Yeah, you like being near the bottom. Uh Lou? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on who I'm with. Anyway, go ahead, Lou. <laughs> Zingo. Um see animalized. Uh yeah, I have this at number 13 as well. So here is where mediocrity sets in after greatness saved them. The best songs are some of the strongest of their career. The weakest song isn't the worst thing they ever did. And the okay songs are just okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paul Stanley Show. Here is where Paul takes the reign. And while I admit the tour had some of their best and most high-octane performances, I mean, let's face it, I've never seen a band play like they were high on cocaine without ever doing the drug until I saw that uh, Animalized Live Uncensored show. <laughs> That's true. It's a hell of a drug, even if you don't take it. Uh, the album itself is not all that great, but I love about 50% of the album and will gladly put these songs in my in my playlist. But the other ones are just throwaway tracks that make me question, why did they even put them together in the first place? Some may say that Asylum is the sister album to this, but if you took the best songs from Asylum and combined them with the best songs from here, you'd have a perfect 80s Kiss album. So do I hear greatness on this? Yes. Is it one of their best? Not in my opinion. And as a guitar player, I really like Mark St. John. I think he's a very good technical player. He's very fluid, and he's got some interesting stuff that he pulls out. I mean, this was actually my late brother Mike's favorite Kiss album. And he said the reason why was because of Mark St. John. But he was also, um, you know, really into like, you know, progressive rock and and jazz and fusion and stuff like that. So it would make sense that he would get some satisfaction out of uh, Mark's playing. But, you know, in hindsight, it's like putting Alan Holdsworth in Mike and the Mechanics. It it, it doesn't work. I'm glad you got a kick out of that, Craig. Now, uh, let me see if I repeat that That would be interesting. <laughs> Ma Manny, did you hear what I just said about Mark St. John? Yeah, I don't know if uh, Mike and the Mechanics would... Uh... Work with yeah. Alan Holdsworth. <laughs> yeah, that would actually. I would really be interested in that. <laughs> I, I'd be scared. Um, by the way, who was the opening band on that tour? The Animal Crocus. Crocus. It was Crocus. Okay, when I cool. saw him, anyway. <clears throat> yeah. So to me, the standout tracks are "I've Had Enough," "Into the Fire," "Under the Gun," "Thrills in the Night," and "While the City Sleeps." Yes, Wayne. I I like "Under the Gun." Um, okay, tracks Heavens on Fire. Eh, eh. If I want to laugh, I'll put on Burn Bitch Burn. I mean, if I want to laugh, <laughs> um, and you know, I, I don't think Get All You Could Take is the weakest track. I would have to say Murder no. How High Heels is. Oh, I'd say, yeah, yeah, that or Burn Bitch Burn. But but I could laugh at that one. Murder and high I can't even laugh. It's just so want... stupid. I can't even laugh at that song. I mean, get all you yeah. get all you can take is is like the Kiss audio equivalent of Porky's Three: The Revenge. <laughs> I never it's saw bad. that one, but I do love it's... the second. <laughs> it's pretty bad, but yeah, um... you don't need to see Porky's Revenge. <laughs> It's just kind of funny how albums age, you know, and I really, like I said, as a kid, I really like that. Um, Lou and Wayne and Greg, when did you guys come into this album? Just out of curiosity. I had a cassette. Oh, God. Must have been the early 90s. I think my father found it in like a car or something because he, he's a tow truck driver. So he used to find yeah. things in junk cars all the time. And uh, I would have the cassette. I, I don't, probably listened to it a couple of times, but it, it just never really grabbed me. Yeah. You know? Uh, you next, Greg. When did you first hear it? I I had the cassette single of Heaven's on Fire when I was about 12 or 13 or so, but I didn't get the album for about another year or two when I was 
actively searching out their back catalog. And this one, I think I actually had a special order from Tower Records. It wasn't that easy to get, even though they had already done the remaster series. Wow. But um, at the time, because I was super into Shredders and stuff like that, I mean, I loved it the first time I heard it. But once the newness wore off of it, I mean, it was never really like my favorite I really liked the guitar work on it, but I mean, the stuff that was bland or not that great really stuck out quite obviously quite quickly. <laughs> I, uh, not as bad as Asylum where uh, I gave it away, but <laughs> I saw the video for Heavens on Fire when I was like five years old because there used to be a UHF channel up here called uh, U68 that showed music videos. And it was really cool. If you were a kid that didn't grow up with MTV, you had this UHF station that broadcast to New York and New Jersey. So it was on there. My brother had the cassette, but I didn't listen to it until about nine years later, like in 1994, 95. So I was 14 years old when I heard it. And you know, I didn't listen to the Kiss albums in sequence. It was sort of like I kind of just, you know, saw whichever album cover mm. best interested me. So, you know, we're going to get into Destroyer next. So that was the first one, then Hotter than, than Hell. And then, you know, five albums later, I picked Animalize. And then I loved it at the time. But then when I went back into the rabbit hole and discovered other Kiss albums, you know, then I was like, wow, this real album really fails in comparison to like, let's say a Creatures or a Lick It Up or I'll even say The Elder. You know, to me, The Elder was a better album. But, you know, at the time when I first heard it, before I heard the rest of the Kiss catalog, I loved it. Now, not as much. <laughs> yeah. All right. What's next? Destroyer, the album that turned them from a spectacle and a full-fledged superheroes. But I think hidden in all that uh, grandiose mm. melodrama mm. and I'm sure cocaine-influenced bombast <laughs> that Bob Ezrin bought to kiss <laughs> is a little bit of misdirection. You know, it's a trend, people. Yeah, Me I tell you, if Frank Zappa wrote cocaine decisions about anybody, it was definitely Bob Ezra. And I mean, I'm sorry, man. I know you love him a lot. And I do. Some, of his, some of the albums he produced, I absolutely love. And I think he did a great job. Like Alice Cooper, Love It to Death and Killer and Floyd and some later Alice stuff. But sometimes when he was really... <sighs> Oh, fucked up there. He made some odd choices. <laughs> what was the name of that Frank Zappa album? Uh, uh, the Man, Man from, from Utopia. Utopia. I'm going to look it's it up. One, it's not one of his better albums, truthfully, but a killer album cover. Yep, and Steve Vai's on it. You can't go wrong with Steve. Well, uh, actually, you can go very wrong with things with Steve Vai on it if you get uh, White Snake slip of the tongue, but. That's a conversation for another. Actually, no, it's not. You're not getting me to listen to that fucking album. Um, <laughs> no, it ends with 87 for me. That's it. Continue, yeah, Frank. Me too. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you was, this real quick. Was, I'm, oh, sure. Go ahead. So, like, so I'm in a cover band now called 90 Below, and I mentioned, hey, you know what would be a cool White Snake song to cover? Fool for your loving, but the 1980 version, not the 1990 version. So just wanted to say that. Good. Go ahead, Greg. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually got this as one of the first Kiss records I had had. I already had Dress to Kill, Creatures of Night, and Alive. And a, a friend of my dad's that he worked with said, oh, you got to have Destroyer. It's great. So I get to the first cup through the first couple of songs, you know, Detroit Rock City and uh, hang on. I want to bring up my notes first here. Sorry. King of the Nighttime World? Yeah, King of the Nighttime World, which actually, re-listening to this as an adult, it's kind of, <laughs> I'm like, 
you know, I still like this, but it definitely loses a lot of power going from Detroit Rock City into that tune. But I still love it. And then God of Thunder, which is great. And then we get to Great Expectations and the Boys Choir and the string section. And it's like, what in the fuck is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> A little and, bit of everything. Yeah. And to be honest, even though Ace wrote it and I usually love his song, Flame and Youth isn't really one of my favorites. It's kind of like Kiss doing a 60s <clears throat> pastiche. And I do like it, but it's kind of just okay but it's short so there's that that middle part came from a demo called mad dog if i'm correct right yes yeah. mm. and i mean i like it 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 isn't a bad song um i think this was just so far out of what i was expecting from kiss when i first heard it that i was kind of like well what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> But um, it's definitely one of their most interesting albums. I don't think everything that Bob had them do or introduced to them 100% works on a KISS level here, which is really the only reason why I have it listed so low, because while interesting, it is a little uneven and does play odd in some spots. However... Some of those are really beautiful moments like Beth, which is just brilliant. I mean, what, what he helped Peter Chris turn that song into is just utterly amazing. And Flaming Youth is fun. You know, shout it out loud, to be honest. Did I love it when I was 10? Of course. What do I think of it now? I'll stick with rock and roll all night. Like, it's fun in concert, but... Not really a song I go to on the album. <laughs> but the one I, the two I really dislike on here, one is Great Expectations. I think it would have been great if it was done by Alice Cooper or especially Mata Hoople or a multitude of other 70s bands. Um, I just don't feel like it's in Gene's wheelhouse. Even if they had given it to Paul, hell, even Peter. I think it would have been fine. I just think Gene's too far out of his element to make that work right. And then, Do You Love Me? I just don't like. I think it's irritating as hell. It's probably one of the worst heavy Beatles things that they did. Greg, were and, you were aware of something, though? What's there, that? Bob Ezrin wanted all four members to sing parts of that song. It wasn't supposed to fall on just Gene. I was not aware of that, but mm -hmm. now some of the abrupt cuts on the different verses make a lot more sense. Yeah. Huh. Okay. I'm, I wonder if that would have made it a better song. Probably not, but... It would have made it platable. I mean, it still Possibly. wouldn't be my favorite Kiss song, but like, um, oh, what's a good example here from another Ezrin-produced album? Oh, I love Give the Kid a Break on Alice Cooper Goes to Hell in the context of the album, but it's not really a song you would pick out of the album to listen to on its own. Right, I agree with that. I understand. Yeah, yeah totally but, agree with that. Yeah. But, but if all Greg's... four members of KISS actually sung Great Expectations, I would feel the same way about it, whereas now I just don't really care for it. But um, it definitely elevated them to that next level and it's great in that respect it's a huge bombastic record that just really elevated kiss into the stratosphere but musically it's really uneven for me and i think it ends up a little bit lesser of one of their records and i know that's sacrilege to some people because of god of thunder king of the nighttime world and um detroit rock city which are great songs in their own right it's just the album doesn't carry it all the way through for me. So good, but not the best. I'd give it a six out of ten, honestly. Wayne? Well, maybe a seven. <laughs> no, you already gave it a six. <laughs> you can't you can't change it now. You can't change it now. Um I know I'm I'm always on a love hate relationship with Dynasty. I mean, there's the classics, this Detroit Rock City, Dynasty, Destroyer. Dynasty. I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, Dynasty, Destroyer. I'm half awake. 
If you Monster, have, right. You okay, know. go ahead. <laughs> um, Detroit Rock City, King of the Nighttime World, God of Thunder, I've hated pretty much ever since I've listened to that song for some reason. But I just never mm. liked it until recently where I, I really love the live version of them playing the song. It just sounds so much better. They play it faster. It just sounds better live than it does in this album. But I've grown to like it on this album, whatever. Great Expectations is another song that I always used to hate, and now I like it. I don't know why. Of course you do, sitting over there with your fucking ghost shirt on. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Flaming Youth. Wait, I like Ghost, and I can't stand that song either. <laughs> it just all of a sudden just grew on me. I don't know why. I have no idea why. Uh, Flaming Youth, I can do without. Um, Sweet Pain, get rid of that one, too. Shout Out Loud, probably one of my top five favorite Kiss songs. Beth is just a great piano, and, and uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't even think right now. You know who I'm talking about. Great, great, just a great thing that they did because it's just piano, orchestra, and him and uh, him singing, and uh, what? Peter Chris. Yes. Thank yes, you. Peter Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that they didn't do before, so it's really cool to hear him just singing like that. And I really like "Do You Love Me." I don't know why you don't like that song. It's just, it's just, it's, it's a really terrible. good Kiss song. I like it. I think it's Kiss. It sounds like Kiss. And that rock and roll party thing at the end of this album is just stupid. I don't know why they had it. Yeah, they can get rid of that. That's shit. No, it agree. made absolutely no sense. Ahead, that was, that was an experiment in sonic excess. Yeah, it was stupid. That's ahead, probably man. Ezra yeah, thing. Yeah, oh, well, I love that, the man. album. Um, I love the album a lot, actually. I don't listen to it as much as I did, but the even the cover is iconic. Um, most of the songs still on the set list. I'm a little sick of Detroit Rock City, but I still love the song. Um, it's kind of interesting. What's the next one? Uh, King of the Nighttime World. That actually is a Kim Foley song that had been hanging around forever. And and uh, I don't know what Paul Stanley and Bob Ezrin did to get songwriting credit for it, but maybe change the lyric or whatever. But they're both giving credit along with a guy named Mark Anthony. But Kim Foley would not become famous songwriter. He became famous being a manager to, uh, or mismanage me and uh, the Runaways. A Devonets Bengali. Yeah. God of Thunder is great. And for years, I thought the songwriter was Gene Simmons. I didn't know it was Paul Stanley. Um, I like Great Expectations, and I can see the songwriting credits as Bob Ezrin. But to me, it sounds like an Alice Cooper song thrown away with bad lyrics. You know, mm -hmm. I could see Ezrin doing that with Alice, and Alice probably said, No, I don't want any more fucking orchestration on my album. That's <laughs> what I, um, because by then, what year was it, 76? Six. So he was already working and completed Welcome to My Nightmares. So his mindset was still on here, but I like Great Expectations, uh, quite a bit. Um, Flaming Youth. Probably the worst song Ace wrote with Kiss. Actually, all four are credited to it. Well, no, it's not. It's Bob Ezrin's credited, along with Ace, Paul, and Gene, which is interesting. So that means the three of them, if they work together, or anymore. <laughs> Sweet Pain is a pain that is it is, it is a pain that it's is the best. very definition of yeah. <laughs> if you want to know where the filler track is yeah. sweet pain is um it's so bad that even at three minutes and 20 seconds you're like it's awful it's terrible <laughs> i can even just hear it in my head i'm cringing you know <laughs> it's and again bad. yeah uh, the lyrics, I, what is it? If one Kiss song doesn't make you cringe, then they're not doing their job. Well, congratulations. Boys, you've done your job. <laughs> I love Shout It Out Loud. I love how juvenile it is. I love the, you know, uh, you know, basically a bunch of stupid kids outside throwing out a party. And, you know, they're shouting out loud 70s style. It, it's, it's the second part of Rock and Roll Night, basically. Basically, really yes. Is. Uh, yeah, it really is. Yeah. And it's amazing. Bob Ezrin gets a lot of freaking songwriting credits on this album. You see that? Oh. Well, 
I mean, you know, when they went into the sessions with him, he he took that he taught them music theory. He took them to music school. Yeah, but if you look at those Alice Cooper albums, he doesn't get song right. He gets a couple on when he went solo, but he doesn't get many when the band Alice Cooper was right. Around. But they knew music theory and knew how to write music. Well, okay, I'll give, you that. <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. He he yeah. probably helped them arrange it and get it out, but you know, it's when when you're you know when you're referring to kids who think very highly of themselves as campers, you know this is obviously a guy who's putting his foot down and saying, "Nope, I'm getting credit on the songs." Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, well, my point is, he also worked with Lou Reed, and uh, uh, the it's a great album if you're into Lou Reed Berlin. Um, he doesn't get any song credit and credit. I think he got maybe one, which Reed probably gave him reluctantly. I'd have to look. And, you know, when he did The Wall, he was shocked that Paul uh, Roger Waters gave him a songwriting credit for some song on The Wall. I'd have to look it up which one it is, but... I'm shocked, too. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Waters is pretty stingy with his uh, songwriting yeah. credits. <laughs> um, by the way, the song Beth, I do like it. But according to um, Stan Penridge, Paul Stanley... And Peter Chris, not Peter Chris, and uh, I think even Bob Ezrin. Peter Chris's songwriting to that song was very minimal. He got his name thrown on there, but according to them, he didn't do much. It's mostly, there's a demo that exists that you can look for it that Stan Penridge well, did years ago, you know. So. No, uh, Peter Chris was in that band with Stan Penridge, and Peter Chelsea, Chelsea Chelsea wrote, well, yeah, wrote the original lyrics to it. It was called Beck. Well, there and should be more about, songs about Jeff Beck. I agree, but, but um, uh, like, not that. I, I mean, the Beck with, with well, no, <laughs> Stan's girlfriend was named Rebecca. So. Well, then, how is Peter Chris? I'm going to agree. Name me one decent Peter Chris song besides Beth that he wrote. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, and the solo <laughs> album, that's mostly Stan. Oh, uh, I can't Henrich remember the name. Or Sean, no, he's, whatever. He's got a couple good ones I like on Let Me Rock You from 82, though. Lady Me. Driver? Baby Driver, Baby Driver. Song. That's a Chris Penridge song. Yeah, that's I think Chris. I think he's asking if Chris has ever written a song solo. Exactly. I I, I know what he's asking. I just don't know. Do you? You know I why don't you know. don't know, Wayne? Because I don't give a exist. shit, and I'm not a guy. Because you're a musical <laughs> yeah, pig. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Nothing it exists. Doesn't exist. No. <laughs> I'm just saying that Peter Chris. Got a lot of money for doing a lot of cocaine and throwing his name in there. <laughs> okay, if Wait. I was in a stu oh, you got one. I think Dirty Living from Dynasty. Nope, that's a co write with Penridge. Yeah. Really? I yeah. just looked it up. Huh. Peter that's Chris surprising. Peter Chris couldn't couldn't compose a fart. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Ouch. Look, I like Peter Chris as a drummer. I think he gets a lot of shit. I think part of the original Kiss sound was the way he drummed because it was more R and B. Did he write know. Tossing and Turning? Fuck no, he didn't write <laughs> no, that. That's right, that. That's that's an R and B song. I know. Yeah, uh, that one I know. I know that one. I can't right. stop the rain. Great song, but you know. <laughs> and he's I, a good singer. I like. I like. He is uh, a good Peter. singer. He, he does I like have Peter a very Chris good voice. Is. Yeah, matter of fact, the original Kiss lineup is one of the few like the Beatles where everyone was a good singer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Lou, what do you think? Let's get this over with. Yeah, Lou, what do you think? Great. It, well, hold on. It says that um, even on his solo album, all the songs he wrote were covered with Stan Penridge. Yeah, he, Holy he, shit, man. Chris has never written a song on his own ever. You know why? Because he, he can't write. Why would Paul? I get why Paul Stanley and Peter well, Chris or Paul Gene, but what? What? Why would Bob Ezrin give a shit? He is a drummer. So well, that's true. Why? That's, why would? Why would Bob Ezrin give a shit about helping him with the song? You mean? 
Yeah, why would Bob Ezrin go payday, well, for Peter him. Chris? Well, Bob Ezrin gave him because some Bob, right because, credit on that one, too. Because yeah. Bob Ezrin heard the demo and instantly recognized it was going to be the biggest hit off of the album. He even told Peter that quite famously, actually. He said, look, we should do this, and we should do this this way, talking about the orchestration and everything, but it's going to be huge, and they're going to hate you for it. So yeah, Bob right Ezrin, he was. he was. So Bob Ezrin, basically what you're saying is he took the song, rearranged it, basically rewrote it, told Peter, stand there and sing. I'm going to bring an orchestra and it's going to be a big hit because I'm rearranging it. Did he at least play yes. the piano? Yeah. He didn't no. play, yeah, Bob Ezrin played the piano, not Peter fucking Did he Chris. play it live? Did Peter Chris play it live? No, no, he sat on a stool and sang to a backup track. Really? Yep. Yeah. I never, I never watched. I, maybe I he, have. He I, did that when I saw the farewell tour. He came out. He's and, always, oh, okay. Uh, yes. All right. Now that I'm, I'm, I'm picturing and, it, and like, he made the mistake of calling Jones so, Beach Long Beach. So then, why did they give Eric Singer the piano to fake play on stage if Peter Chris didn't play the piano either? Because the they've been doing the same Peter. fucking thing since 1977, man. It's Kiss. They got to sell the brand. They got to change the show up once in a while. Uh, all right, Lou, let's you, get over. Oh, oh, wait, do you think this. there's a single person in the audience that really thinks that Eric Singer is playing the piano? Yes, there was. I've had to mention it You're to a few people. And no, not me. I... <laughs> Didn't they notice the piano lid was closed? Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, magic fingers. Um, so this was my first Kiss album. Uh, the story is that I was getting my brother Tony into a lot of the bands that I was into at the time. Uh, 93, I was, you know, I, w I really wasn't crazy about like some of the bands that were being played on rock radio because I, I really didn't care for Pearl Jam. I didn't really care for Nirvana. I love the Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, but you know, at the time there was a band called Tool that had just released Undertow that I was really, really digging on. So I got my brother into that band. And he said, you know what, let me get you into one of the bands, one of the albums that I grew up loving when I was your age. So we went to Nobody Beats the Wiz, which Wayne bought out, which is, you know, what we have behind him. And um went over to the K section. And we go to Kiss, and he pulls out the Destroyer album. Destroyer is the first CD that I ever bought with my own money. Um, but I looked at it, and I was like, you want me to get this? They look like four. At the time, when I was a kid, I used an expletive that you're not allowed to say. <laughs> but again, I was 13 years old from New York City. Okay, there's no room for political correctness at this time. So oh, hey, they say it in Detroit Rock City. I mean, <laughs> what? They don't say that in Detroit Rock City. Yeah, they do. The movie. Oh, the movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which came out like six years later. Anyways, moving on. Right along. Um, so uh so I said, okay, I'll listen to it, you know. For three weeks straight, all I listened to was Detroit Rock City. I had never heard anything like it. I never heard this song before. Again, I was 12 going on 13 so it really made an impression on me and for about two months straight destroyer was all i listened to it was so different from everything else that was on rock radio and everything that was going on in the mainstream because i really wasn't into the gangster rap i wasn't into the grunge i wasn't into the r and uh, i couldn't relate to it but for some reason this album hit me as a as an impressionable youth Sorry, I meant Ute. Anyway, um, so I ended up falling in love with the album, and it's in my top ten um, of of favorite Kiss albums. And I, I, I'm Greg. I'm willing to be objective. It's probably there for the nostalgic purposes. Although I'm willing to admit, Great Expectations is the worst song on the album. Um. My favorite being King of the Nighttime World. There's just something about that song where it's like it 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 hit me as a kid. You know, I just I fell in love with it. 
Um, I, I prefer the Alive 2 version of God of Thunder because I, I like that tempo better. Although when I first heard God of Thunder off Destroyer, I was like, what the hell is this? Because all I pictured in my head was Godzilla destroying Tokyo. You know, like <laughs> that that that's the image that it gave me. Um, and And I'm not going to lie. Ace Frilly was a big influence on me as a guitar player growing up. Part of the reason why I put a kill switch on my strat was because I used to love it when he would hit the A chord, then do the toggle switch up and down on his guitar. You know, I thought that was cool. Little did I know that Tom Morello would base his entire career on that move. So <laughs> screw him. <laughs> but, well, you know, true. Ace was hugely influential to me as a kid. Although it's kind of sad to note that most of his lead parts i i know on sweet pain yes i think possibly flaming youth it was done by dick wagner yes even the guitar on beth is done by dick wagner hey guys i'm sorry to interrupt but i gotta go i gotta get my kid so oh you saved your hour hurry up because i got a radio show to do okay so you know that was um i still love it i still love this album all right great everybody thank you very much for watching (laughs) <laughs> Is that it? Are you done? Yeah. All right. You sure? Yes. I'm done. SeverinAngel.com. <laughs> Go buy the album. New album Skywards coming out on May 3rd. And brand new video dropping February 6th. That's right. Uh, I would say RatsOutReview.com, but I haven't updated that yet. So uh, just be on the lookout for that. Freeworld.fm. I will be on there at 10 p.m. every Wednesday night, which I'm going to do right now because it's 9.58 and I should have been already ready. I don't even have songs set. So join me in the chats uh, and I'll try to re- do requests and all that shit. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Yes. yes next time. For tuning in. Yes, this is a lot of fun. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Rock and roll party.